The Inbetweeners was a TV show that told the universal British coming of age story. That came out during a time where wet hair gel and chinos was the standardised uniform across Britain. So why 16 years later is this show still just as culturally relevant as it was when it came out? The Inbetweeners was the brainchild of Damon Beasley and Ian Morris, who first met as producers on the breeding ground for British comedians, Channel 4's The 11 O'Clock Show, and then later on on Meet Ricky Gervais. They're the first people I really worked with in television. Um, uh, they were my producer directors, my sort of team. We did bully Gervais, Gervais a bit, yeah. It was just like being at school, like, oh, haircut. It was honestly nine o'clock in the morning, just just a room full of adults going, oh look, he's got new shoes. You couldn't say anything like, um, oh, I'll have, I'll have cheese and ham. Oh, he loves ham. Yeah. For him to say that we bullied him is is true, but. He also bullied us, and it would be whichever, whoever said anything wrong or wore anything wrong or anything that happened, they were immediately leapt upon. I mean, I'm worried about this is why I just wear black. There's nothing they can have a go. Well, they can. They go, oh, I've got a beard. I have got a, my watch is a little bit big. That's worrying me. And it's it just they never really grew out of that that um, uh, camaraderie, that that teasing. Um, that faux bullying. In fact, Ricky's friendship with the duo were being influenced throughout their career, with Ian and Damon naming their production company after something he said. They used to call each other chicken a lot, and just like <laughs> if someone, if someone sort of like uh, wouldn't do something, they would just go bwark, bwark, right, like right. that. And so they called their production company bwark. <laughs> and then when you're having a fucking actual meeting or something, or you're talking to someone serious, like in television or something, and you go, oh, I've got, I've got to go and speak to the people at Bwark later. In 2004, while living together, they launched Bwark Productions, which I've just said with a lisp. In an interview, Ian stated, we didn't entertain each other by playing PlayStation and telling stories of our youth, so we decided to scratch an itch and write a sitcom about teenagers trapped in suburbia. Channel 4 commissioned a pilot, which ended up as Bunk Off, the second episode of the first series of The Inbetweeners. A lot of the things that happened in that episode happened to Damon. He did draw on a girl's driveway, he did tell a child their parents would be obliterated in a nuclear disaster. Then Channel 4 said, why would anyone watch a bunch of teenagers on a Friday night? But E4 did a survey and found out that young adults wanted to watch themselves. That's what led to Skins. They also wanted comedy, so Channel 4 took our script out the draw. We made a pilot that didn't really work. Still, E4 were desperate and commissioned a series, but only if we totally recast. And recast they did. In the pilot episode, James Buckley played Neil, but off camera he was far more outgoing, so was cast as Jay. But you can see from this rare clip of the pilot just how bad the characters were miscast. What? It's with an I. My parents christened me with a Y, but I spell it with an I. I'm sorry, we were playing theirs? <laughs> Somebody day to be the world's biggest sad <laughs> So I guess you're in love with me then? Yeah, um, can we not talk about it right now? Why don't you come over to mine tonight? I'm babysitting for my little brother, we can chat about it then. Really? Yeah. Come over at 8, my folks will be gone from 7.30. It's probably best to avoid them until this is washed away. Yeah, I'm not too sure that this will... Well, at least you spelt my name their way. That'll cheer them up. After the terrible pilot, a number of the characters were cast from the British comedy circuit, finding Greg Davis as Mr. Gilbert after watching him in a tiny pub, hiring him directly on the spot, and finding Simon Bird and Joe Thomas for their roles after watching them do their Edinburgh comedy show fresh out of uni. Ian said, We thought Simon was too camp, and Joe was too odd, so hadn't cast him in the pilot. We auditioned hundreds of other Wills and Simons, but no one seemed right. And when we saw them, the producers at Channel 4 went, where have you been hiding these two? Because they were perfect. I maintain that those four young men are the funniest male actors of their generation. The chemistry between the cast was evident in making this show. Even from the early days of filming, you can clearly see there's a bond and creative energy between the cast and crew, which are vital ingredients to making something special. On the 1st of May 2008, the first season made its debut on E4, with the first episode getting 238,000 viewers and the entire season 
season, averaging just under half a million viewers. Later that year, the first season also received two nominations at the British Comedy Awards, winning both Best New British Television Comedy and Best Male Comedy Newcomer for Simon Burt. By the first episode of the second season, the show had more than doubled its average viewership of the previous season, to almost a million viewers, and then a further 250,000 on E4 Plus an hour later. And then, by the third season, the viewing figures would basically double once more, averaging 2.6 million viewers, the highest viewing figures E4 had ever seen. It's hard to put in perspective how culturally relevant this show had become. Most notably, the sayings and quotes of the in-betweeners infiltrated every British person's vocabulary. You wouldn't find a friendship group that doesn't reference or use quotes from this show. There are so many scenes and lines that are used for meme material, as well as that, it almost becomes woven into our identity because of the wave of shared experiences during that time period. The soundtrack to the show was also arguably just as important as anything else in making the show a success. The music was chosen by former XFM DJ Marsha Shander. The sounds of the Inbetweeners was most definitely a product of its time, with the soundtrack including British pop and alt rock anthems of the past and of the time, helping this show be further layered in nostalgia. During an interview, Simon Bird was asked if he thinks the show could be made today. I honestly think it wouldn't be commissioned today. Asked about whether it was due to the sitcom's sexist references, he replied, Yeah. And the casual homophobia, I rationalise it to myself by saying at the time, it was just an accurate representation of the way teenagers talk to each other. Is that still the case now? I assume not. Although the programme was set in the 2000s, it was based on a pilot set in 1990. So even in the 2000s, it wasn't really an accurate reflection of how teenagers spoke. Which, to be honest, I think I'm going to have to disagree with, because this is genuinely one of the only TV shows that speaks in a way that teenagers genuinely speak in. One online commenter stated, Yeah, it's still the most accurate summary of teenage life in England that's ever been shown on TV. It's literally like they just followed real life teenagers around with cameras. The banter and everything is just so spot on and relatable. Really great show, it deserves its highest status. Following the conclusion of the third series in October 2010, the cast and the crew of the show indicated that there would be no fourth series as the program had run its course. After the final series, they left it how most TV shows should end, leaving the people wanting more. The people wanted it to keep going, but if it was going to come back, they had to do it in a way that complemented the original series and not taint its magic. They discovered the least inoffensible way to bring this IP back was in the form of a movie. The film would see the foursome, now 18, go on their first lads holiday to Malia after their final year of college together. I thought about them going on holiday together, um, you know, before we wrote the first series really, it made sense that at that time in their lives that's what 18 year old boys were doing. If we got to the point where there was an appetite for a fourth series or, or you know, seeing the boys doing what they were doing at 18, then it felt natural that they'd go on holiday. And that's what we did. It's what Pretty much everyone I know did, to be honest. So we had this file, the anecdote file, when we started writing uh, the Inbetweeners, and it became apparent that there were quite a lot of the anecdotes that we wanted to squeeze in, which happened on holidays. So it was always something where we thought, well, we've got almost, you know, an embarrassment of riches in terms of stories. So it, you know, we couldn't almost deal with it in a TV single episode. And and I think in terms of the narrative timeline as well, it always felt like it should be when Pop. they've left school. On the 17th of August 2011, the Inbetweeners movie made its debut in cinemas across the UK and Ireland. The film had a budget of just £3.5 million and blossomed in a return of an incredible $88 million. The critics gave it favourable reviews and to anyone who loved the Inbetweeners, the film was fantastic. But when it later released in the United States, the movie received mixed reviews from the American critics, which can you blame them? Half the comedy probably went straight over their heads. In fact, a few months before the Inbetweeners movie came out in March 2011, it was announced there would be a spin off US version of the Inbetweeners, which got picked up by MTV. This left people both concerned and optimistic, mainly because people had seen the success of both the UK and US versions of The Office, so it had a chance to be great if it translated. It got picked up by MTV after ABC. 
NBC failed to make an American version of The Inbetweeners in 2008. This led to MTV hiring Brad Copeland, who is known for writing on Arrested Development and My Name Is Earl, to write the script with none other than Taika Waititi to direct the pilot. The Inbetweeners USA debuted in August 2012 on MTV, but had poor reviews from the outset, with most British fans feeling like, what the fuck is this? However, just three months later, MTV had decided to not go ahead with the planned second season of the American remake. Which, if you watch side by side, you can understand why. Did you get hard on? Because the pretty girl spoke to you. Can you fuck off? <laughs> Hang on, you haven't actually got a stalk on, have you? Oh my god, he's got a boner. Jay, please. Oi! Simon's got a boner! <laughs> boner! Oh. Did the pretty little lady give Simon a boner? No. Oh man, I think she did. Oh, Jake, don't. Seriously? Jake, oh, no. Don't. Wait, Jake. Oh, Simon's got a boner. <laughs> <laughs> Simon's got a Boss wankers. <laughs> Why are you slowing down? I tried to spust it. <laughs> Joe Thomas, who plays Simon, stated that the US remake failed because they didn't cast weirdos. Well, it, it, I, I, think, I think we can say it didn't work. But I, I think the reason it didn't work is, is because there is, I think it's a very British show. And like, it's ironic because actually, in a way, we were bouncing off. America really invented that genre of like teen comedy. Like they did it first. And then we, so we were, you know, riding on their shirt tails or whatever. I just think there's a sense of loserdom and failure in British comedy that kind of is represented in the in-betweeners that I don't think it's not that you I, 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 it, was, it was just too sort of glossy wasn't it I feel like though all those the cast was just too handsome I mean look at us yeah They're I mean you got look at got, him you've got to cast weirdos Horrible. you've got to cast find some weird looking people the when they said the, when Ian Davis said the, the time they thought the show first might work when they were like, that might actually be funny, is when they just saw the four of us standing next to each other, and they were like, oh, actually, that is quite a funny little one. <laughs> One's quite tall, he's got a weird haircut. The little, like, the little one, this guy is quite These weird. Glasses. Yeah, so I don't know whether it's just America feels like a bigger and a, in some ways a, a more precarious and a more dangerous a, a country where the stakes are a bit higher, where like, it feels like in Britain, although they'll, although they'll fall, they'll sort of be caught somehow. Like they're gonna be okay, even though they've messed everything up and even though it, literally everything's failed. And I think maybe in America, the idea of a literal total abject failure is just not quite as, you're like, oh God, that might just be yeah. really terrible. <laughs> like, um, might end up on death row. Following the success of the first movie and the need for a palate cleanser after the US remake crashing and burning, it was only a matter of time until a sequel would be made. It would detail the boys, now in university, visiting Jay in Australia who is on a gap year, where he claims to be a DJ at a popular nightclub in Sydney and living in a luxury mansion. However, when they turn up, he's actually a toilet attendant who's living in a tent in his uncle's front garden. The Inbetweeners 2 would be released once again across the UK and Ireland, managing to achieve 63.8 million at the box office after releasing in Australia as well. The reviews of the film were mostly still positive, however, a lot of people felt like it was the weakest entry into the Inbetweeners universe. After the Inbetweeners, Damon created a brand new TV show about a fictional double glazing window company, starring James Buckley and Joe Thomas once again, in 2017 called White Gold. The show was highly praised by critics and fans alike, running for 12 episodes across two seasons. Alongside this, James also has a very successful YouTube career with gaming, vlogging and even podcasting with his wife. Like Damon, Ian would continue to have a prolific writing career, co-writing a screenplay for a movie with Taika Waititi and writing for numerous TV shows. But it wasn't just the creators who kicked on as well. The Inbetweeners kickstarted the careers for everyone, with Blake Harrison starring in movies and TV shows, and Simon going on to star in one of the UK's other most popular sitcoms, Friday Night Dinner. After the cast and crew had gone their own separate directions in the industry, it was announced that a special retrospective program featuring the cast would be aired to mark the 10th anniversary of the program's first airing in 2008. However, some fans were left confused, believing that The Inbetweeners was coming back for a one-off special episode, after typical news sources like Lad Bible began spouting bollocks. However, James was quick to call them out. I never said 
ever, ever said there was a new episode of The Inbetweeners. No one ever said that. Apart from, not that they said it, but you'd get pricks like the Lad Bible saying mm. there's a new Inbetweeners coming. So you click on their thing and they get some sort of statistic and traffic towards their website yeah, exactly. and stuff like that. And it's like fucking idiots like them that got everyone all riled up. Mm-hmm. And they get, they don't give a shit because they get all the clicks and all the and all the people going to their website. And it's left up to me to explain. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. So those <laughs> didn't help it. And they are a bunch of c**ts. <laughs> the retrospective programme would be called Friends Reunited and air on Channel 4 on the 1st of January 2019. However, it was poorly received by critics and fans alike, with many wondering why Jimmy Carr was hosting and not Greg Davis, and wondering why it was essentially a poor man's game show, with the majority of the cast looking uncomfortable. One online commenter stated, this was terrible. The lads thought they were just going to chat about the in-betweeners, but Jimmy Carr constantly insulting them and acting like they were actually the characters of the program was just stupid. Feel sorry for the lads, really. The following morning after the show aired, James Buckley tweeted apologising for the reunion episode, stating, Feeling pretty hated right now. I'm sorry to anyone who feels let down with last night's show. I'm especially upset as it is really the fans that made the Inbetweeners a success. It certainly wasn't me. I might do an explanation video on my YouTube, or might just leave it and move on. Hashtag sorry. And explain the situation on YouTube he did. I got asked to do an Inbetweeners 10 year reunion celebration show back in like August, September last year. Mm. And my whole thing was, yeah, that'd be great. That'd be such a laugh. People will see the four of us together and we'll talk about the fun that we had making that show. Mm-hmm. And um, and that will be that. And I didn't... I was making a TV show. I was in America at the time. I was making a TV show for NBC. So I wasn't as involved with, like, going... All oh, right, so what? what is the show, actually, though, by the way? What is mm-hmm. it? Cause, and also, I just thought... That's impossible to fuck up. Just put the four of us boys together on television and have us talk about the Inbetweeners and people will love that. Yeah. And I was like, there's no way that anyone could fuck this up. And it wasn't until I was sat there in front of Jimmy Carr and the audience was there that I knew what the fuck this was and what was going on. And I found myself in this really weird situation where I thought it was going to be a night where we were all going to talk about that thing that we did that was good and that everybody loves us for. Yeah. Well, that would have made the most sense. Yeah. What it turned out to be, and also, like, I just wasn't thinking, because Jimmy's, like, a huge hero of mine, and he's always been really, really nice to me, and he's been... And he's a really, really great guy, and I do love him to bits. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, And so I was excited that he was involved, because he's great, Jimmy. And then, it wasn't until I sat down, I was like... Oh yeah, this is what Jimmy Carr does, isn't it? So it became a thing where it wasn't a celebration of that good thing that I did in my life. It was me being taken the piss out of for mm. hours and end. And I didn't have the personality or the intelligence to cope with it. 16 years after the show, it's still a staple within the British meme zeitgeist, infiltrating comedy, language and pop culture. I think the reason why it worked so well was because in the early to mid 2000s, there were so many TV shows and movies coming out of Hollywood that documented the American coming of age stories, especially about mapping and exploring sexuality. But there were so very few pieces of relatable media that documented the British experience so authentic. So when The Inbetweeners was born, it spoke to everyone regardless of age, gender or identity. Thank you so much for watching this video, it really does mean a lot to me. Make sure to follow me on all of my socials at Fat Mima, like, subscribe and comment below what you want to see next.